This is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Jack O'Brien, and thank you for joining us again for another episode. We really appreciate you trusting us with your ear pods there we go we'll get that out and your car speakers whatever it is that you're listening to this on and uh, really appreciate your honest reviews ratings all those things on spotify and itunes and all the platforms and so we've got another episode here for you today i'm super stoked to bring on another guest to the podcast we have my good friend all the way from edinburgh in scotland good luck interpreting his accent we have one the only gavin bell joining us today how are you gav I am great. It's a pleasure to be here, Jack. Super, mate. Well, uh, we've we've known each other for, geez, it'd have to be four or five years now, I think. And uh, I've really enjoyed working alongside you and, and you know, growing our businesses together. And uh, from a distance, your expertise and knowledge on Facebook and advertising and also speaking has been a real inspiration to me. So I'm really excited in this episode to dive into your expertise around Facebook ads specifically. But before we do that, is it all right if I ask you a couple of rapid fire questions so we can get to know Gavin Bell a little bit more? Let's do it. Let's warm up. All right. Here we go. Short, sharp and shiny. What are you reading right now? I am reading and I've forgotten the actual name, but it's Jordan Belfort's book on, I think it's straight line selling that it's called. Uh, uh, Yes. He's the Uh, Wolf of Wall Street dude. Yeah. He, He is. Yeah. Or maybe that's what it's called. The Wolf of Wall Street. I can't remember, but. I'm not maybe his biggest fan, but I thought it would be interesting to take some lessons from his obvious success in selling and how we can put it into uh, an advertising world. Mm, nice. Okay. Who inspires you? Uh, I think there's there's somebody that we both mutually find inspiring, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a bit of a polarizing character to some, uh, but I think just what he does and preaches and his his honesty it's something that in a digital world where there's so many gurus and people being dishonest, I think he, over the years, has just been the one that's shined, shone through them all for me. Yeah, he's a fascinating character. I was probably attracted to his you know, alpha bravado um, hustle at the start. Went a little bit cold on him, but that that test of time, yeah, has really shone through. Yeah. And um, yeah, that resonates with me heaps. I love it. What did you want to be? Growing up, I assume it wasn't a Facebook ads guy. <laughs> what did you want to be? <laughs> no, there's uh, there's been a few things in my life. Uh, I think the earliest one was an astronaut. Then I wanted to be a rock star. I used to like cut out guitars from cardboard, paint them as a guitar, and then go into primary school and, and pretend to do gigs. <laughs> and then probably from the age of about 14 was when I wanted, I knew I wanted to run my own business, but I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. So there's right, been a few right. Yeah. Amazing. And and when did you start running your own business? So at the age of 14, I built my first website uh, and that was like what is now commonly called as drop shipping. And yeah. it was drop shipping back then, but I mean, it wasn't as big as it was now. And I would go to like on family holidays with my parents, buy fake Armani belts and then sell them on eBay, cut my neighbor's grass, all these different kind of like showing the entrepreneurial symptoms, if you will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was when I was 18 that I set up my first proper business and then when I was about 20 ish I set up the current business that I now run the the Facebook ads agency amazing yeah right dive straight in no mucking around yeah it's uh, it's been a fun ride I like it what's uh what's a motto that you live by now oh that's a great question um for me probably just work hard and don't be a dick it's probably <laughs> probably the best one um although I, I quite like to create mottos that for for where i am in my life at the time so like i will come up with a, a specific motto if i'm like right i need to do more of uh, here's an example i create a lot of content on like Instagram stories, for example. And sometimes that Instagram stories could be used on the likes of LinkedIn rather than me creating tons of content everywhere. And Mm -hmm. um, so a motto that I've lived by recently or I'm constantly questioning myself is, can I share this anywhere else? Sounds simple, 
but just having that post-it note on my screen and thinking about it all the time, it's helped me to distribute my content better across different platforms. So whenever I know there's an issue or something I could improve, I try and create a motto and live by that for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. I like it. Was that inspired by anyone or it's just uh, you've learned that over time? Quite, yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think specifically, but one thing I have done over a long period of time is rather than just looking at one person like Gary V, for example, is like the answer to all my problems is I try and take inspiration from, from different people. Uh, and when you said that we've, we've kind of known each other four or five years, I can echo what you said. And I've looked at your journey over the last four or five years since I've known you. And that for me is inspiring to see how you've built a business. And I remember speaking years ago about some of the issues and problems you had and now you've got solutions to those issues and problems and I'm like that's amazing and how can I learn mm-hmm. from that so I think learning from different people and different things that the different seasons and stages of life is is really important mm. I love it it's amazing mate and so you touched on a little bit there your business growth and that journey into entrepreneurialism and we're, we're going to land on the Facebook stuff so listeners stick around because you'll your mind will be constantly blown by the, by the <laughs> stuff that we can do with Facebook for health clinics specifically. But run us through that story of that first, well, we talked about the dropshipping business, but how did you get into the digital ads and marketing space? Yeah, good question. So I, ha- I had a business where I was putting health practitioners uh, into corporate environments. So this, that was my first, biz- first proper business at 18. So I would be putting just a wide range of people from personal trainers to nutritionists into corporates around the idea of, well, healthy staff equal more motivated and and more productive staff. Mm -hmm. And um, I I created that business. And because I was really naive and young at the time, I created a bit of a monster in that it just the business had no focus and because the business (laughs) had no focus, it it didn't do very well. But one of the things that I found whilst running the business was I built a lot of relationships with kind of health practitioners here. And I realized that they were terrible at marketing. The reason that they were coming to me for this corporate well-being was because they didn't have enough business sure. and they wanted me to kind of get them into corporates. And I looked at that and I was like, well, I'm effectively marketing their skills to a corporate audience. But I look at their Instagram and their Insta- if they're going after uh, 50-year-old people that want to lose a little bit of fat, Mm-hmm. Their Instagram is broccoli and six packs. I was like, there's a disconnect there in the message that they're putting sure. out. Uh, and that was kind of when I then was like, well, I can help these guys. This business isn't really giving me what I wanted to, but I can help these guys market themselves better. And uh, that kind of led me into uh, launching the business as a social media management business, just managing their social. A few clients then wanted me to run some Facebook ads for them. I was like, I'm not an expert, but I'll, I'll do it for you if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, did it really enjoyed it, got decent results and realized that there was a kind of gap in the market for somebody to really, especially here in the UK, become the Facebook ads guy. And um, since then, that has kind of been the journey that I've wanted to take and have tried to to take is become that well-known person in the space. It's incredible, mate. And it's been a massive rise. I, yeah, like I said, I've, I've loved watching it from a distance. And it, I think that one of the interesting learnings for me out of your journey is that, you know, an agency is a service-based business in a lot of ways, like a health clinic. And you've built that business and, and you've got team and clients all over the world now. You've also built your personal profile alongside of that. Uh, you do a lot of speaking and the YouTube channel has thousands of subscribers. Now, can you talk to us, Serene, around why you built that personal brand alongside your agency brand? Yeah, great great question. The, the initial spark for me was looking at my own consumer behavior and realizing that when I am on Twitter, I don't follow a logo. When I'm on Instagram, I don't follow logos. It's just like a, a unwritten rule in my life and I was saying well if I'm trying to get the maximum engagement from the content and the things that I put out there if I'm operating under a logo I'm going against what I'm doing as my own my own consumer behavior and I'm not saying it's wrong it's just this is what I did and so I thought well if somebody's watching a YouTube video of mine and it's me Gavin Bell and then I'm sending them off to kind of at the time really corporate brand Mm -hmm. agency brand it's just a, it just felt disconnected for me 
And so when I decided to not scrap the business brand, but kind of just go for me and try push people to my website, it almost just like gave me permission to be myself. Mm-hmm. But when I when I had the business brand, so I first started it, and when I first created it, it was called Blue Cliff Media. Right. It's now called Fat Pony because I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> but when I created Blue Cliff Media, I was almost operating by doing what I thought I had to do, which was have a professional looking brand, uh, a corporate looking website, and I'm, I'm Mr. Professional. And it, it just didn't feel right. And so going down the personal brand route felt right. And so now when people see me on stage or watch my videos on YouTube, see my ads, it's my name. They come, then they can come to my site and they can see that I have a membership program. They can see I have an agency where we uh, work with brands and do it, uh, do it for them. And they can make their mind up there and then. And so there's, sure. not, there's none of this like hiding behind the facade of we're a large agency that a lot, I think a lot of people try and do early on and what I certainly did try and do early on it's just it's just allowed me to be myself really online which i think is important oh, i love it i love it i've got a couple of questions on that around the personal branding uh, you're you're a pretty fascinating character you know there's going swimming in like the the scottish sea in the middle of winter and tough mudders and all sorts of things did that create any pushback from clients or those that didn't realize your personality i wouldn't say it caused any pushback one thing that did happen though was I started to create too much content on my life rather than my business. Right. Uh, and so oh, if, if you look at my life over the last say three years, nothing has mm-hmm. changed. I've always run a business and liked going outdoors at the weekend. Sure. But my content online slowly moved towards the stuff at the weekend because it got more engagement. And to be honest, I got addicted to like the likes and the comments and the shares and the hundreds of mm-hmm. thousands of views that the videos were getting. But what happens when you go too far that way is perception is reality online. People started to see me as the outdoor Scottish guy as opposed to Gavin's actually a business owner that's really good at Facebook ads type thing. Mm -hmm. And so got to a point where I was creating tons of content, but it wasn't the right audience. It wasn't the right people coming. I wasn't telling the right story, the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning of this year, I was like, right, I need to change this and made a massive U-turn. And that's caused a massive pushback on things like engagement, video views, followers, subscribers. They've all taken a massive hit. Right. But the people that are sticking around and watching now are the right people. Uh, so there's not been pushback from clients, but there certainly has been pushback from like an engagement point of view, which mm-hmm. at the end of the day is vanity, but right. it's still something. It's an interesting learning. I'm sure there's clinic owners that are thinking, you know, there's often a push towards being more personal and relaxed and, but sometimes that at the expense of result, you know, the commercial reality of creating content yeah. and, um, and ads, there's got to be that balance. And probably yeah. in your experience, obviously the only way to find that out is to test and measure and experiment and, and use that data then to guide decisions, right? Yeah. And I think the key here is the narrative that you tell. Mm-hmm. So now the narrative that I tell is I'm a business owner, first and foremost, Facebook ads, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Because I tell that narrative, I can post a picture of my new kitten or I can post a picture of Spartan or mm-hmm. Tough Mudder because that's now like one post out of seven, for example. It's part of my life and me showing my personality, but it's not the full picture. Sure. Whereas when I was a Scottish guy, it was the full picture. So it's really important to for the health clinics and, and people out there that want to build their personal brands to understand what the narrative that they're telling is and then be able to let bits of their personality shine through through that narrative. Love it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last question on that before we dive into Facebook. You are now, like your website is Mr. Gavin Bell, and you are Gavin Bell. Do people, I think there's often a fear that if I put my name up on the shingle, virtually or proverbially, that people will only want to work with me. What's been your experience around that? Yeah, I, I would say um, actually... Older clients want me because they kind of bought into me. Uh, Whereas now people coming to us, I'm very clear and I say, you're you're, you're getting me. Communication will be from me, but I have a team of people that are going to actually be doing the nuts and bolts of your ad campaigns. And so, and and you know what I say to them is they're better than me at doing it. 
And so I find that if I'm upfront about it, I tell them that they're better than me at doing it, but you're still communicating with me and getting me. I've not really had any pushback, to be honest. At the end of the day, I had this fear myself, but at the end of the day, people want results. And mm -hmm. if you can prove that you're going to get them results, I don't think they really care whether it's me or somebody under me or, right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Results matter. Okay. Speaking of results, how do we get results with Facebook ads? <laughs> How's that for a question? <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Big one. Well, I'm going to dive straight into the kind of methodology that we would use with a, with a health clinic, health practice, which is all about, I think the, first of all, let me cover what mo most people will do when they're getting it wrong, mm -hmm. which is they think all they need to do is stick up an ad offering say 30% off to people in their local area and they'll get the floodgates open. But <laughs> right. It's not, it's not that, that easy, you mean? No, right. cer certainly it's not. So what I like to do is take people through almost three stages. So first of all, we want to try and build the brand of the practice in the area and, and build that initial trust because in a local area when you're, where you've got set competitors, the person that goes the furthest and helps the most is always going to win. Right. So we, first and foremost, we have to, we have to say to ourselves that we are going to become the best educators in this local area. So it's a mindset. So what we want to do is, I would, I would argue that like 50% of success on Facebook is mindset over mm. people, people get caught up in the technical nuts and the bolts of the bidding, the, the targeting, the, I don't know, the ad copy, which don't get me wrong. It's all important. Right. But if you fundamentally don't have the North star of, we are going to become the best educator and we're going to advertise in a way that actually provides value to the people in our area as they go on Facebook, it doesn't matter whether you've got the best targeting copy, it's just not going to work. So, so, good. so the first, first key element is we need to understand the problems of the people in our local area. And one of the areas I think people get this wrong is speaking in their language as the therapist or the clinic or the practice mm. uh, and speaking about like technical terms, whereas the people in the local area might have something like, well, I'm just using this as an example, but the, the language that they might use is my back hurts. I don't right. know what's wrong with it, but I need some, someone to fix it. So we need to create content that speaks in their language, the way that they're thinking. And if we start to do this consistently and pushing those videos out to people in our local area, what starts to happen is people start to be, we get, we become known. People start to sure. know who we are in the local area. And then on Facebook, we can create retargeting ads, which is essentially where we, re we serve an ad to somebody that has seen our video, our blog, been on our website. And if we can then retarget the people that have watched those initial videos, we can serve them an ad that says, hey, look, we know you've watched our videos on, let's just say back pain. Mm -hmm. So are you interested in coming for a free consultation or a free seminar? The next step is we essentially make a free offer an offer that is still valuable to that person, but almost provides us as a practice, a bridge of the, a bridging of the gap of someone that is kind of knowing who they know who we are a little bit sure. and trying to get them to become a customer. Uh, and then once they've taken us up on that free offer, if they do, then that's when we can try and convert them into a, uh, a patient or customer, whatever term you want to use mm -hmm. using various methods. So for me, the, the most important part of a Facebook ad strategy is actually that initial point of contact, awareness, top of funnel, creating content that's going to help people in your local area. That's amazing. With that content, is that something that would be amplified or boosted? And are there any specific yeah. uh, mistakes to avoid or hacks to, to work towards? Yeah, well, first of all, it doesn't have to be boosted. But if you boost it or you promote it through, through Facebook ads, you're essentially just going to get results and reach faster. That's all you're, that's all you're really doing. So it depends how quickly you want to, to build an audience. I, I would always recommend spending money on ads, even if it's as little as $1 a day, just to have more people coming in. Because the reality is in a local area, if you're creating, well, you've got, you've got a set audience, right? So there's, there's only a set number of people that you can target. 
And, and here, here's a key point, actually. When it comes to targeting in a local area, always go broad because yeah. Facebook is getting so, so smart that if we just go broad rather than targeting, like I'm just using back pain as an example, but whatever condition or problem we're trying to solve, whatever it may be that we're helping people with, if we go broad, Facebook goes and finds the right people for us now. So go broad in your local area targeting, which means you can eliminate the targeting element of your Facebook ad campaigns because you just go broad. Right, right. So you're and saying we've, we've gone so tight on demos that, that Facebook intelligence has no room to move. Better yeah, to let exactly. Facebook do its thing. Exactly. And, and if we're creating content that's valuable and helping people, it's going to cost us next to nothing for like. Facebook, it's in Facebook's best interest to show that to more people because we're providing a positive experience on the platform. Mm -hmm. So we create really valuable content. We can then promote it out to people in our local area broadly. Facebook will then serve that ad to the people that are most likely to watch it, people that are most likely to take the action that we want them to take. That means that we start to build our audience pretty quickly and rather cheaply as well. So to answer your question, you don't have to promote it, but I would always recommend we do put spend behind promoting our content. And I, I tend to just do that constantly for me and for, for the clients we work with. Awesome. You touched on free events or seminars, and I know that you worked with heaps of health clinics across multiple countries. So this isn't just a Scottish thing. This is globally. Mm -hmm. What's been the strategy or success behind promoting events? Yeah. So for first and foremost, I can, I can walk, walk you through the exact campaign. Targeting sure. wise, we just go local area, demographic, nothing else. That's it. I.e. like the area and the age. And um, then the, the hook that we really use is like, do you want to learn more about this thing? So whatever the thing is that you're trying to sell and get out in there into the world is, it's, it's going down the educational route again, Jack, which is, mm. We're putting on a free seminar. Would you like to learn more about whatever it is that we're trying to, to promote? And what we'll find is like there, there are people in the local area that want to learn about this thing. And then they come into the room, we educate them about it, and then we give them the opportunity to book in a consultation or work with us there. And I think the seminar model is, is a really good one because it – in a world where it's all about webinars and online stuff, the seminar experience allows somebody to see you, hear you, speak to you, shake your hand. It just builds that trust like immediately. And to get somebody from a Facebook ad to sign up for a free seminar that's five minutes down the road from where they live is actually not too hard a task to do. So you're almost like, it's almost like a quick and easy thing to get people to sign up to and then has enormous benefits from a trust perspective. And if you find that you, you maybe aren't getting as many people signing up to a seminar as you want, then you can start trying to um, provide a little bit more value to them and saying things, well, we'll put on a free dinner or we'll provide free tea and coffee, like just little things to try and make it seem a little bit more attractive. One of the problems you do face when you do do something like that is you can, the quality of the people coming in can reduce and because they're just interested in the free dinner. Sure. So it's, it's a testing game there. But like I say, I think the seminar works really well just because you're, you're sticking to your roots of being educational. It's a relatively low commitment thing to get them to do to sign up for a seminar in their local area and the trust benefits of it, the relationship building benefits of it are, are huge. That's awesome, mate. And I think it'll really resonate with the clinic owners that are in our community. It, it's, it's a real client experience value yeah. that resonates with us. And so to create an environment where people can come into your space, uh, maybe do those little one percenters, like I say, it's just the, the herbal teas rather than the El Cheapos from the supermarket um, yeah. that you could, you could really refine the experience that would then provide trust and proof around your health service. Uh, I think you've, yeah. you've thrown in a I couple think, of really good, sorry, you go. I, I was just going to say, I think what you say there is, is the absolute key to all of this, which is it's very easy to think Facebook ads or any ads and think, okay, trying to immediately push a sale and get somebody right. to take an action. But what we're doing is we're using the ads and the technology that we have to 
build and improve that customer experience. Because at the end of the day, if they don't trust us, know and like us, they're never, ever going to work for us. So we're using these tech tactics, technologies to build that relationship with that person. It's a long game. Yeah. Mate, you've thrown out a, a whole bunch of amazing pearls so far, little one percenters that make a massive difference. A question I know that's often burning with those that are inside our Clinic Mastery Business Academy and, and those clinics that we work with on a higher level is, should I do all this all myself? Or should I get someone else to do it and outsource it? You're one of those outsourcing options, obviously, but how do people make that decision? How do they help make that choice? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really, really good question. And actually, I've got the agency and I also have my academy. So I kind of have both sides of the, we can either do it for you or teach you how teach. to do it yourself. Uh, and I would say that the, obviously time is going to be a massive point here. I, th I think there's a few elements that are that are key. First of all, time. Building your funnels and your ads takes a lot of time and takes a lot of testing and a lot of like brain space to get right. Um, and so if you're someone that literally just has no time to do that and isn't willing to commit to spending time and learning and testing, then that's probably when you should outsource it. Because the reality is if you kind of go in at Facebook ads and all of this half-hearted, given it like 50%, you won't see the results that you need to sure. see. So that's when I would suggest outsourcing. However, if you're somebody that is, is like tech savvy, you love the numbers, you kind of, the best way I can describe it is like you have a, this kind of conversion mindset where you're committed to seeing your business almost as a series of conversions, i.e., how many leads do we need to get a customer? How many customers do we need to get to our revenue goals, et cetera? If you're willing to have that mindset and you're willing to invest the time and energy into trying to make this work, then actually it might be worth doing it yourself. So I think time is probably the biggest factor. Another factor is, is money as well. Outsourcing a good agency will cost you quite a lot of money. Sure. Uh, and so you need to have a business model that allows you to be able to spend more money to acquire a customer. So you need to be thinking about things like the lifetime value. Sorry, I say customer, like a patient. You need to be thinking about how much can we spend to acquire a lead? How much can we spend to acquire a patient? And when you start to know these numbers, then it becomes a, a maths game of, well, does it make more monetary sense for me to outsource this to somebody looking at the ad spend and looking at their management fee? Or could I get similar results? doing it myself mm -hmm. the, the, the reality is you're going to get a better job probably you're going to get a better job better results faster by outsourcing it but it's going to cost you more money it's your your you could get the same level of results slower but it's going to take you time energy and money to get there by doing mm -hmm. it yourself so i think it, it like i say it varies on time money but also just the mindset and the personality of of that practice owner, do they want to learn this sort of stuff or, or do they want to focus on other parts of the business? It's a good point. And uh, I love that you practice what you preach around the education element. You've got a podcast, you've got the academy. Can you uh, just give us the, the sound bite on what the academy is all about? Yeah, so the, the Funnel Academy, which is what it's called, is give it a context. I had a Facebook ads course, realized that that only attracted people that wanted to run Facebook ads for clients. And I saw that there was a need for business owners and clinics to operate under the whole, like develop their full funnel. So the offer that they're going out to market with, how to run the ads, how to build the landing pages. And so the, the Academy walks people through that process um, with a ton of training videos, but also a weekly coaching call with me every week so that, they can come on and ask questions and get support as they work their way through the program. So the, the goal of the academy is to have a business that comes in that maybe relies on luck marketing, I call it, like referrals, <laughs> sure. word of mouth, and, and to help them build a system that means that they know how much money they're spending to acquire a lead. They know how many leads they need to acquire customer or patient. Mm. That's awesome, mate. And I know that you've got the runs on the board with health clinics, uh, which is a really subtle, nuanced field that not many agencies understand. And so that, that's, uh, that might be really attractive. If listeners, clinic owners wanted to 
find out more about, uh, you know, we touched on your personality and personal brand, speaking, YouTube, all that stuff, or the work that you might be able to help them with, where should we go? Yeah, the best place to go is just mrgavinbell.com. Uh, and that will link you off to the podcast, the the membership, the agency side of things. And um, if anyone has any questions about any of this, just head over to Instagram at Mr. Gavin Bell again, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions and, and help with anything I've spoken about on, on the podcast. Awesome, mate. Listeners, we will link all that up over at clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. You'll be able to find all of Gavin's social handles and website links, everything that we have touched on here in today's episode. Gavin, it's been a, a real pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been fun. Good start to the day. Great start to the day for you and end to the day for us as we're on opposite <laughs> sides of the globe. But uh, listeners, thank you again so much for tuning in. Like we said, you grab all the show notes over at clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. Thank you again for your reviews and ratings on your player of choice. And we're looking forward to bring you another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast again really soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode. 